spent most of my childhood in the waters of northern Ontario. We made sand castles along the shore, and we floated in homemade rafts, and we swam before breakfast, and we swam after our morning chores, and we swam in the afternoon to cool off, and of course, we went swimming right before bed. In fact, some days we didn't get out of the water long enough to have lunch and our parents would bring us peanut butter sandwiches and we'd float around in inner tubes by the shoreline and eat our lunch that way. I spent so much time in the water that at night I would dream about being a mermaid and being able to swim and breathe underwater. Surprised that I don't have fins and gills, I don't, do I? <laughs> The Rothbergers loved the water of Thailand. And he said that water was a never-ending source of enjoyment there. One photo was taken during the annual Songkran, a New Year's celebration. Originally, water would be poured over the shoulders of the elders as a blessing. But this festival has erupted into good-natured soakings that celebrate and cleanse and prepare people for a new year. Water isn't always abundant, though. Beth Ann Schreiner spent two and a half months walking along the Appalachian trails, and she would stop regularly at places that were <coughs> mapped out for water. But one afternoon, she arrived at the checkpoint, realized that she'd missed that day's water source. Checking her maps, she saw that it wouldn't be until noon the next day before she could gather water from a marked spring. She realized that the day was so hot and that her supply was so limited that if she went on without water, she would become sick. Well, one choice was to return back and get water from, from the last checkpoint, but she'd already missed that, and, and what if she had trouble finding it again? So she walked up and down the roadside until she could see water trickling over some rocks and collecting in a ditch. And from the ditch, she filled her water containers and threw in a couple of water purification tablets. She said she wasn't happy to drink that water, but she was grateful to God. And if anybody had told her previous to that day that she would be drinking ditch water, she would have said they were crazy. The Israelites did not have water tablets, but they were grateful for the purification instructions given to Moses by God. They'd been in the desert three days after being liberated from the Egyptians. In the desert, they walked down the wadis and washes, the parched, dry riverbreds that served as highways uh, in, the, in the wilderness. Off in the distance, they could see the rock face, the Shur, the mountains that gave the desert this name. They had been traveling three days without a fresh water source when they came to the well at Myra, at Mara. Can you imagine their thirst? Can you imagine the thirst of their animals and the thirst of their children? With great expectations, they lowered their buckets and their skins into the well only to discover that the water was bitter. And then they cried out to Moses. They said, what are we supposed to drink? Moses turned to God for help, crying out to God in prayer. And God instructed Moses to throw a piece of wood, a certain piece of wood, into the well. And Moses did, and the water became sweet. In Hebrew, that little word, God instructed, or God showed Moses. That's what it says in our Bible, God showed Moses. But in Hebrew, that word really is closer to instruct or teach. But if I said, God taught Moses a tree, that's not communicating the message well. It's also important to note that that word, instruct, teach, is also the root word for Torah. <coughs> Those were specific instructions and laws that God gave Moses on Mount Sinai so that the people could live in covenant with God. So we might say 
that God tore it Moses a tree or a piece of wood. God shared life-giving instructions. Moses followed them and the water became fit to drink. Moses was God's agent turning the bitter water into sweet water. When we read on through the rest of that piece of scripture, we learn that God continued to interact and to teach the Torah and to set rules and procedures to keep the people well. And the story ends with the people arriving at the oasis of Elam, where there, there are 12 wells, one for each 12 tribe. The external journey hints at the people's internal journey. They've journeyed, journeyed from a thirsty, bitter place to an oasis with lots of water. And with God's instructions and Moses leading, the people have changed from frightened, bitter grumblers into obedient, sweet, God-centered people. We don't live in an Old Testament age. We know Jesus. We know the living water that God gave us. But if we're to follow the teachings of God and love our neighbor, we could find ourselves doubly responsible for thirst. First, since one billion people across this globe lack access to clean, safe water, and three million people, most of them children, die from water-related diseases, we need to quench their thirst by bringing them water and sanitation. So our congregation has taken two missions this month one in Appalachia and one in Zimbabwe. We will be donating to the Living Waters for the World, which is run by the Presbyterian Church. They work, with, they work in eastern Tennessee and Kentucky to supply in-home water treatment systems for families who do not have access to uncontaminated water. The water in the, their regions has been polluted by coal mining and by gas and oil extractions. And sometimes the water has been turned bitter by too much bacteria or by high levels of iron. These in-home water systems turn the water sweet again. <coughs> the old Mutar Hospital in Zimbabwe is one of three hospitals sponsored by the United Methodist Church. Women come from all surrounding areas to give birth to their babies at this hospital. But the water system and the sanitation systems are really old. And so there's not enough water for childbirth. They're reliant on a bucket of water and the Umcor childbirth kits. Our donation will make a difference. It'll help them make safe water for drinking and for cleansing the mothers and newborns. We will become agents like Moses, following God's instructions to care for others and make their water sweet. It's a good start, but it isn't quite enough, is it? We also have to use our water wisely. While water is constantly being cleansed and renewed by the earth, we are actually using it faster than it can be naturally recycled. In the region of Old Mutar Hospital, the average person uses three to five gallons, just three to five of these per day to wash and cook. But here in America, we use 100 to 150 gallons a day. In fact, we probably use three gallons every time we flush the toilet. By using our water more wisely, we protect the environment, maintaining it for the fish and other animals. We preserve our own drinking water supplies. And we reduce the burden on the wastewater plant. The less water we send down the drain, the less these plants have to work to make the water clean again. Jill Heinrich is a friend of mine, and a fellow mermaid, I would say who has gone on to serve God by exploring the world's waters. She swims through the aquifer. She swims right in the earth's plumbing. 
And she's come, by doing that, she's come to realize how entwined our water under the earth, where we draw it from for our, our drinking water, and what's going on above the earth, and around the globe, how all of that is interconnected. On Friday, we're going to be seeing her full-length movie as part of our water festival. And it, it tracks the underground roots and what happens to water before it comes to our taps. But right now, I'd like you to listen to Jill's personal experience of water and her plea to save this essential resource. You know, my earliest memory was of drowning. We used to spend a lot of time at a cottage up in northern Ontario, and one time I slipped away from my parents. Moments later, I was floating face down on the surface of the water. As I remember it, I was seeing these beautiful rainbow ripples on the sand below me. I wasn't scared. The water was embracing me. But moments later, my mom's navy blue sneakers with flowing white laces landed in front of me and snatched me out of this place, this beautiful place of comfort and embrace. I think I've spent the rest of my life trying to get back there again, back inside the womb of Mother Earth. Every time I slip beneath the surface, I feel a spiritual connection to the Earth and a deep reverence for water. I realize that I'm swimming through the very essence of our planet. The earth embraces me, and I get to share through my photographs and films a breathtaking world that few people will ever experience for themselves. As a kindergarten kid who loved show and tell, I realized that I never stopped doing that even 40 years down the road. We are water. This is more than just a film. It's a movement, and I'm asking you to join me. How can you help? Well, start by taking a kid to a spring, or a river, or a lake, or the ocean. Let them have fun. Let them get wet. Let them love and understand that water resource as something that's important to them. Because when they love it, they're going to want to protect it for the next generation. This is about the fact that our bodies are 70% water, and our planet is 70% water, and we're all intertwined in this dance called life. We are water. We are water. Our bodies are 70% water. And our world is 70% water. And on Friday, we're going to have fun and teach others how to love and protect that water. We'll be addressing thirst through water conservation and by helping people be provided with clean drinking water. But if we're really truly being God-centered, then we're also going to be creating thirst by being the people that Jesus has called us to be, by loving and protecting the water, by loving and providing water, we are showing people what it is to be Christian. We will be creating an interest in becoming a Christ follower. Some people would say, isn't that church just full of perfect people? And we answer, no, it's full of caring people who are working towards sharing water resources wisely. We, we're not the best conservers ourselves. We're all learning together. Some would say, isn't that church just about wearing the right clothes on Sunday? And we'd say, no, it's about making the whole world a healthier and more merciful place. Someone would say, I don't want to go to that church. They're just after your money. And we say, no, come on. We're giving you food. We're giving you fun. We're giving you a free movie and friendship so that others can have water. The money collected doesn't stop in our pocketbooks. It isn't used for our needs. It's going to be used to bring life to others. On Friday, we will have the opportunity to break those preconceived ideas of church and show people what a disciple of Christ looks like. 
we'll have the opportunity to create a thirst for living water, a thirst for Jesus. All of us are, have strong memories of waters. Hear stories of splashing in the ocean or swimming in Severin or jumping into Chesapeake Bay are part of the history of our neighborhood. We want our children and our neighbors to protect and share water so that others can have great memories like that too. We want our children and neighbors to come to know Jesus as the source of living water. We want them to know we are Christians by our love. Amen.